So thanks a lot, Tim, for the invitation, and thanks for the generous introduction. Um, and I, you know, I'm excited to be here in southern Minnesota to, to have a chance to talk to all of you. It's, it's uh, it was a, I mean, uh, Mitch's presentation was a great learning experience for me. Certainly, I got a lot out of it, and uh, it's great for me to have a uh, chance to interact with such a diverse uh, set of businesses as, as, as we have represented here. Um, so I became president of the Minneapolis Fed in October 2009 after many years as an economics professor. Um, um, many of them at, at the university itself. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in Winnipeg, so I, I actually came down to Minneapolis fairly often. But uh, I, I have to say that my new job, where I travel a lot around the Ninth District, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the contours of the Ninth District in a few seconds. But my new job has brought with it many uh, unexpected and wonderful new experiences. But giving a talk in, in a dairy is certainly one of them, I have to say. And that we, we, we have batted around a variety of corny things I could say about the experience. It's utterly wonderful. Um, but uh, you know, don't have a cow about what I'm going to say. But, but I, I think I'll spare you the, the further attempts at our humor. Um, so what I, what I want to do today is to talk to you about some basics about the FOMC, my outlook for the national economy, and the implications of my outlook for, for monetary policy. And I'll look forward to taking your questions after that. Um, but before I proceed, and this is important, I want to stress that the views you're about to hear are my own, not those of others in the Federal Reserve System, and especially not those of anyone else in the Federal Open Market Committee, not necessarily those of uh, anyone else in the Federal Open Market Committee. So let me start with some basics uh, about the Federal Reserve System. <clears throat> and I like to say that the Fed is really a uniquely American institution. And what, what do I mean by when I, when I say that? Well, relative to its counterparts around the world, um, the U.S. Central Bank is a highly decentralized central bank. So the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 regional reserve banks that, along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., make up the Federal Reserve System. So our bank represents the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve uh, districts. And that, 12, uh, that ninth district includes the state of Montana, both the Dakotas, the state of Minnesota, the northwestern part of Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Eight times per year, uh, the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, meets to set the course of monetary policy. All 12 presidents of the various regional Federal Reserve Banks, including myself, and the seven governors of the Federal Reserve Board are part of those deliberations. Now, actually, right now, there are only five governors, because there are two uh, unfilled, uh, unfilled positions. The committee itself, the people who actually vote on monetary policy, consists only of the governors, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and then a rotating group of four other presidents, so it changes annually. So uh, right now, the presidents of Cleveland, Richmond, Atlanta, and San Francisco are uh, part of the voting committee. And I'll be, uh, I was on the committee last year, um, and, uh, um, and I'll, I'll, I will be again in 2014. Now, in this way, the structure of the FOMC and its meetings mirrors the Federalist structure of our government, because representatives from the different regions of the country, the various or, or regional Fed presidents, have input into the FOMC deliberations. Now, I think this Federalist structure is very important because it fosters valuable two-way communication between Americans and their central bank. And it's exactly the, the kind of two-way communication that we're, we're engaging in today. Now, one direction, of course, is clear, that the direction of communication from regional Fed presidents to the residents of their districts. But I think the other direction matters a lot, too. You know, the, the, the input from the presidents of the FOMC relies critically on information they receive from their districts about local economic performance. <clears throat> and we obtain this information through the work of our research staffs, but we also obtain it through uh, dialogues that I have with, with local business leaders and community leaders. After I'm done talking, your questions and comments will be another in, important input into my thinking about policy. So what we have is a, 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 a two-way communication between the residents of Main Street and the Federal Reserve System, which is mediated by the presidents of the regional feds. And I think this is a critical ingredient to the system's ongoing effectiveness. So that's sort of a, a, a just context, a very a real sketch of, of a sort of FOMC and Federal Reserve System basics. 
What I'd like to do now is a turn to my outlook for the national economy. I'm going to focus on three variables that are of particular interest to the FOMC, output, inflation, and unemployment. So I'm going to, my discussion of the, of the outlook is going to proceed in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the past, the behavior of the economy over the past four years. Next, I'll describe my model, uh, which is a fancy way of saying my story for those events that took place over the past four years. And then I'm going to take that model and for, use that to form an outlook for the next two years. So I'll start with a look back. So the national economy slowed dramatically during 2008 and the first half of 2009. So the National Bureau of Economic Research dates the recession as having started in December of 2007. And beginning then, you see a, a dramatic slowdown in, in the economy. National output, as measured by gross domestic product, adjusted for inflation, that is real GDP, fell by 5.1% from the fourth quarter of 2007 through the second quarter of 2009. The unemployment rate, which is 5% in December of 2007, reached 10% in the second half of 2009. Now, since the middle of 2009, which is when the National Bureau of Economic Research, Research dates the uh, recession as having ended, the national economy has recovered, but at a moderate rate. After four years, national output has returned to its pre-recession level. But I think it's important to note that returning to the 2007 output levels is a relatively low bar. Output remains about 10% below where it would be if it had grown in line with historical averages. We usually think of output growing at around 2.5% or so per year. So if we're back to where we were at the end of 2007, that means we've lost out on 10% of growth that we usually expect to have. Now, given the sluggish recovery we've seen in national output that I just described, it's not surprising that labor markets are also healing slowly. Now, employment fell by 8.7 million jobs and has recovered only 3.6 million of those jobs. On an encouraging note, the national unemployment rate has recently fallen to 8.2% after peaking, as I described, at, at, at 10. But the fraction of people over the age of 16 who have a job, which uh, we, we call the employment population ratio, that fraction is still nearly 7% lower than it was in December of 2007. Now, while output and employment remain quite low, inflation has remained remarkably close to the Federal Reserve's 2% target. From the fourth quarter of 2007 through the fourth quarter of 2011, the personal consumption expenditure, PCE, price index, has grown at an average annual rate of 1.8%. So I remember, I, I, as I just mentioned, the Fed's target for inflation is 2%, and the, the price, the PCE price index has uh, grown at an average annual rate of 1.8%. Now, I want to emphasize here, and it's important given, given some of the commentary here, the PCE price index is an index that includes all goods and services. It includes food and energy goods and services. So I'm not talking about so-called core inflation. I'm talking about what's called headline inflation, so all, the price of all goods and services. And that's, that's uh, risen at an average of 1.8% uh, over the last four years. So that's a brief review of the past four years. Real output has recovered back to 2007 levels, remains well below what would one expect it to be in light of historical growth patterns in the United States. Employment remains well below 2007 levels, and unemployment uh, remains well above 2007 levels. Inflation has averaged close to the Fed's target. So that's the past. Now I want to turn to the question of how one might use these data to fashion a forecast for the next two, uh, year or two. And any forecast of the future is based on an economic model, a story of how that past data came to be. My story for the past two years centers on two key changes in the economy. The first is that from 2006 to 2012, households have lost trillions of dollars of wealth and net worth as housing and other assets have fallen in value. 
The second change is that households and firms now feel that they must stay prepared for the kind of financial market shock that they experienced in 2008. And I see these changes in economic conditions as improving over time, but only slowly. So why do these matter? Well, many observers, including me, have emphasized how these two changes, the fall in net worth and wealth for households, and the increase in uncertainty for firms and households, how these two changes in the economy have given rise to a fall in the household's demand for consumption goods and in firms' demand for investment goods. Fortunately, the Fed's highly accommodated monetary policy has served to mitigate this fall in demand. The Fed's policy has pushed downward on short-term and long-term interest rates. And these lower interest rates encourage consumers to spend and firms to invest. And what's less often emphasized, but I think is also critical, is that the productive capacity of our country has grown much more slowly than we would have expected prior to the recession. Now, that statement may seem strange at first. Our workers have not been harmed or injured in some fashion. Our factories have not been damaged or destroyed. But it's that productive capacity of a country does not depend simply on the number of workers and factories uh, uh, and machines available. We live in a dynamic economy in which enormous numbers of firms, plants, and jobs are continually created and destroyed. The productive capacity of our economy depends on how well that dynamic process of creation and destruction, the ongoing reallocation of people and machines across economic tasks is working. Productive capacity has grown more slowly than usual because this process of reallocation has been materially affected by the fall in household net worth and the rise in firm level of uncertainty. Now, this kind of damage to productive capacity takes many forms, but let me take, I'll give you two concrete examples of what I have in mind. New firms are a major source of employment growth in the economy. But to start a new firm, a household needs some kind of capital of its own to initiate that startup. And so having a fall in household net worth and wealth makes starting new firms more challenging. Indeed, the number of new firms has fallen sharply since 2006, and so it's not surprising that employment in turn is lower. At the same time, as I told you, existing firms have a fear of a, a recurrence of a 2008 financial market shock. That fear keeps them from hiring workers who they might have to fire if 2008 recurs. Both of these forces, fewer startups and the firm's fear of hiring, reduce the productive capacity of our economy by making it harder for destroyed jobs to be replaced by created jobs. So my view is that the economy has experienced both a reduction in the demand for goods and damage to its productive capacity. Now, it's important for me as a policymaker, as I think about the outlook and what kind of policy would be appropriate given that outlook, I'd like to know which of these two changes is more responsible for the low levels of output, the reduction in demand or the damage to productive capacity. To answer this question, it's useful to look at inflation. If the demand for goods remained below the productive capacity of the economy for, many, for multiple years, then we should see significant downward pressure on prices. Inflation should be well below the Fed's target of 2% and possibly falling. But as I indicated earlier to you, that's not been the case. So it does not appear that demand is significantly below the productive capacity of the U.S. Now, I'm not saying, and I want to be clear about this, this observation does not mean the Fed's highly accommodative po policy was, not, was, was unwarranted. Without that policy, I'm sure that output, employment, and prices would all be lower than they are today. After all, if you go back to the early years of the Great Depression, from 1929 to 1933, prices were falling at 10% per year. It's deflation. Rather, my point is that the Fed's highly accommodative policy has kept the demand for goods relatively close to the diminished productive capacity of the economy, and so has kept inflation near 2% instead of being much, possibly much lower. So my model of the past four years is that there's this fall in demand 
and, a and damage to the productive capacity of the country. Highly accommodated monetary policy kept demand close to, to productive capacity and kept inflation close to the Fed's target. What does this model imply for my outlook for the evolution of output, employment, and prices over the next four years? My view is that it will take several more years for the damage to productive capacity that I've described to heal. So I think output will grow only moderately at around 25 to 3% in each of the next two years. This moderate growth will imply that output will remain well below what we might have expected it to be back in 2007. And remember I told you that we should have averaged, we would have expected us to uh, an average of 2.5% growth from 2007 to 2011, which we didn't see. To make that up, we have to grow faster than 2.5% per year. And I'm not predicting uh, sizable, uh, 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 that, that that will be tr true in any market way over the next two years. In a similar vein, I expect the rate of employment growth in each of the next two years to be only slightly higher than the rate of population growth. In terms of unemployment, I expect that the unemployment rate will continue to fall, but slowly. It's 8.2 percent today, expected to be around 7.7 .7 by the end of the year, and to around 7 percent by the end of 2013. Let me turn to inflation. I, I think that it's true that low household net worth and wealth will continue to represent significant headwinds for demand. So I, I would view a highly accommodated monetary policy as being appropriate. But as I will explain shortly, I expect that the FOMC's policies, policy will be even more accommodative than I would see as being appropriate. So I do uh, think it is appropriate for monetary policy to be highly accommodative but I expect the FOMC's policy to be even more accommodative than I think would be appropriate. So I expect that core and headline PC inflation rates will be around 2% this year and rise to 2.3% in 2013. So to sum up, I expect output to grow at 2.5% to 3% per year in each of the next two years, unemployment to fall to around 7% by the end of 2013, inflation to average over 2% over the next two years. Now, how much confidence should you have in this outlook? So I'll give you two conflicting answers to that. First, any forecast should be viewed as only a benchmark look into the future. Policymakers and the public should both be prepared for other eventualities. And uh, I, I, I cannot underscore that enough. With that said, the second uh, countervailing uh, 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 thing I'll cite is that I don't think my admittedly scanty, scanty forecasting record is all that bad. So in February 2010, when I gave my first speech as Fed president, I provided a public outlook for the evolution of real GDP, inflation, and unemployment over the next two years. My forecast for real GDP at the end of 2011 has turned out to be too high by about 1.5%. My forecast for unemployment at the end of 2011 was about 30 basis points too high, so 0.3 percent. My forecast for headline PCE inflation has proven to be almost exactly right. So those, that's, uh, that's my uh, view on the outlook uh, for the next two years. The next thing I want to do is try to use that, to use that outlook to answer three questions that I'm often asked about monetary policy. But before I get to answer those questions, I should remind you where we stand in terms of monetary policy. So right now, the FOMC has two types of monetary accommodation, monetary stimulus in place. First, it is targeting a short-term interest rate, the federal funds rate, of between 0 and 25 basis points. That's 0.25% and it expects to keep that interest rate extraordinarily low at least through late 2014. So we're early, second quarter of 2012, the FOMC expects to keep that interest rate extraordinarily low at least through late 2014. These low interest rates are intended to stimulate consumption by households and investment by firms. At the same time, the FOMC has bought a large amount of long-term government issued and government backed assets. And these asset holdings are designed to stimulate longer-term investment. More specifically, 
any holder of a long-term bond is exposed to interest rate risk because the value of that bond fluctuates as interest rates vary. When the Fed buys long-term bonds from the private sector, the private sector as a whole is exposed to less of that interest rate risk. As a result, some private investors will demand a lower premium for holding other bonds that are exposed to interest rate risk. So by buying long-term bonds, the Fed is lowering the premium for interest rate risk on all bonds. All long-term yields fall, and corporations should correspondingly lower the hurdle rates for long-term investment projects. Now, the FOMC does have additional tools. It could exert further downward pressure on long-term market interest rates by buying more long-term treasuries or other securities issued by government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Alternatively, the committee could extend its prediction for how long to keep, interest, uh, to keep its short-term interest rate exceptionally low. It's, right now, it's saying through late 2014, it could extend that time period to a later date. So tools remain to the committee, and so therefore choices remain. So that, what I'm going to uh, uh, try to answer, I will answer for you, uh, that I'll discuss, are three questions that I'm often asked about those choices. The first question is, should the FOMC increase its level of accommodation? I've described what it has in place right now, described my outlook. Should the FOMC increase its level of accommodation? So Congress has mandated that the FOMC make monetary policy so as to promote price stability and max employment. In order to achieve these goals on an ongoing basis, it's essential that FOMC choices evolve in a systematic fashion with the state of the economy. So what do I mean by that? Well, suppose, for example, that unemployment and the outlook for unemployment falls back toward long-run norms from being elevated. That means the FOMC is doing better on its employment mandate. Such a change would imply that we don't need to increase monetary accommodation and may, in fact, need to reduce the level of accommodation in place. Similarly, suppose inflation and the outlook of inflation were to rise. Again, the FOMC doesn't need to raise the level of monetary accommodation. It's doing better on that. Uh, it doesn't need to raise the level of monetary accommodation given the behavior of inflation and may, in fact, need to reduce the level of accommodation. So these are the basic guidelines. Unemployment comes back down toward long-run norms. Um, inflation rises. Uh, then you don't need to add accommodation. So let's go back to uh, beginning of last year, January 2011. Unemployment rate, 9.1%. FOMC expected the unemployment rate to fall only slightly by the end of the upcoming year and to remain at 7.9% by the end of the following year, so uh, roughly two years away from, the, from the January 2011. The FOMC expected core, piece, core PC inflation, getting rid of food and energy, to be 1.2% over the course of the coming, upcoming year and to be 1.3% over the course of the following year. So that's the way things looked in January 2011. What about now? Unemployment rates fall into 8.2%. I expect un the unemployment rate will be about 7.7% by the end of this year and about 7% by the end of the following year. Inflation, I expect to be 2% uh, in the cal this calendar year and over 2% next year. So if you go compare where we are now to January 2011, the outlook for the unemployment rate has improved and the outlook for inflation has risen. In addition, if you, uh, and I won't go into the details right now, but since the beginning of last year, the FOMC has actually added more monetary accommodation compared to what we had in place in January of last year. So I don't see any need to add still more accommodation given that conditions have improved and given additional accommodation was provided last year. Indeed, as I mentioned earlier, I think the FOMC's recent accommodative steps will lead to both core and headline inflation being above 2% in 2013. Now, the second question I get is, should the FOMC reduce accommodation? Now, using the same logic I just described, the answer is yes. From the point of view of the dual mandate of uh, price stability and max, promoting maximum uh, price stability and promoting maximum employment, the outlook is better than a year ago, so we should have less accommodation in place. This doesn't mean necessarily that we should be raising rates anytime soon. If you go back to June of 2011, the FOMC issued a consensus statement 
which described a sequence of steps that it would foresaw using to normalize monetary policy from this uh, current uh, extraordinary uh, um, setup setting. The, the ex exit process the committee described is a long one. It's designed to take place over a number of years. And the committee would likely not raise rates for some time after the exit process begins. I don't think the committee should start this exit process unless it can be reasonably sure that it won't have to reverse itself in the near term. I don't feel that kind of certainty right now. And it would follow then that it's not yet, not yet time to initiate exit, let alone raise rates. However, I do think it would be appropriate to change the Fed's current forward guidance about the future course of interest rates. So as I mentioned, the FOMC statement currently reads, the committee believes that conditions will warrant extraordinarily low interest rates through late 2014. My own belief is that we will need to initiate our somewhat lengthy exit strategy sometime in the next six to nine months or so, and the conditions will warrant raising rates sometime in 2013 or possibly late 2012. Now, the third question I'm asked is, would you ever be in favor of adding accommodation? I've described how I'm not at the current time in favor of that. And the answer to this is yes. If the outlook for inflation fell sufficiently or the outlook for unemployment rose sufficiently, then I would recommend adding more monetary accommodation. There are a number of ways this could be done, but my own preference would be for the committee to uh, purchase additional treasuries are securities issued by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in an attempt to drive longer-term yields uh, further down. More generally, as I discussed earlier, any forecast should be viewed as only a benchmark look into the future. Hence, I believe the committee would be well served by describing a public contingency plan that discusses its likely policy reactions to an array of scenarios that are viewed as possible the next year or two. I think this kind of contingency plan would be beneficial to the economy by reducing the public's uncertainty about the committee's ability and willingness to react to various future contingencies. And I think a public contingency plan would also enhance accountability on the part of the FOMC by forcing the committee to explain how its choices are linked to the evolution of the economy. Okay, so I've talked about a lot of things as I, as I tend to do when I talk. Um, let me talk, go back to two points that I think are very important. First, the fall in household net worth and uh, increase in firm uncertainty since 2007 have had adverse impacts on demand and on productive capacity. Over the past four years, the FOMC's highly accommodated policy has been successful at keeping demand close to productive capacity, as is evidenced by how close inflation has been to 2%. I don't see any need for further additional accommodation at this time, and I believe the conditions will warrant raising rates well before the end of 2014. Second, the FOMC has become more transparent about its benchmark outlook for the economy and the evolution of policy given that outlook, but outlooks are always uncertain, and they're especially uncertain today. So as I described in earlier speeches in some detail, I believe that the committee would be well served to be more public about how it would react to scenarios that differ from its benchmark scenario. Thanks a lot for your attention. I look forward to taking your questions.